This would be my fifth moderation for doing debates on behalf of the Bradford Board of Trade and the Homeowners Growers Association who put this on tonight. Uh, looks like we are going to be requiring a few more chairs. This is a good crowd, an excellent crowd. The, uh, how do you say your, uh, what Skarioke. Skarioke yeah. Entertainment. Skarioke Entertainment is providing the microphones tonight. Big round there. So a couple of a couple of ground rules. Uh, first, like you to pretend that we're in a movie theater. Turn your theater, uh, turn your phones on vibrate um, or mute. mute. Um, we're going to allow for uh, pictures as long as you're staying on the uh, same level, so pretend it's uh, like some fancy forum for, uh, you know, get some checks or playing or something, so just respect others around you. Basic ground rules are going to go like this. We've had a number of questions submitted. None of the candidates have seen any of the questions. We have a couple of other questions coming in. If you have a few other questions that you'd like, please have them go back to Jody. Jody, wait, please. If you have a question and we have time, we're going to do that. The ground rule is fairly simple. Um, you are all the candidates, correct? We will vote for this. You're all the candidates? Cool. Because no substitutes are allowed for a candidate. Uh, Laura Lee, you're still yourself? Cool. Okay. <laughs> this is an open riding, folks. What that means is that there's no incumbent. I want everybody to give a big round, even though she's not here, for Julia Monroe. She's not here for you. Julia has retired. Tonight is the first debate amongst all the candidates. What I want you to recognize is the following. It's an open riding. They don't carry the baggage. They're here to tell you why. I'm going to give them a big round when I've done this because they have the guts to sit up here. None of you do. They're the ones up here doing this right now. It takes an awful lot to be up front. It takes an awful lot to be up front. Second, this is the way that they're going to be speaking. It's one to five, five to one. So the closing is going to be down at the end there. Dave, I think that's, you're going to have to turn your sign for me anyways at some point so I can yell. Thank you. I got Dave right. Who knew? Dave is going to be the opener for the close. Laura Lee will be starting off. They have two minutes to start off with. Each of them has two minutes to move forward with. Then we're going to get into the questions. Questions are going to go from one to five, and then it's going to go two to five to one and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That'll be me keeping it on track. They have one minute to respond to the question. I'm the guy that's gonna be keeping time. When they go over, you'll hear me say something like, stop. If they continue, you'll hear me stomp the floor at the third time, then they'll be escorted back to their chair very quietly. How's that? <laughs> right now, it looks like we have room for eight or 10 questions. We have five candidates. We're going to start off with number one, which is Laura Lee. We're going to move to Carolyn. And then we're going to continue down, gentlemen. So you have two minutes to respond to uh, an opening statement. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back here at the All Candidates Debate in Bradford. We had such a respectful debate uh, back in 2014 with Julia Monroe, and it was my honor to come such a close second to such a fantastic, long-standing MPP. Um, since that time, I've gained even more elected public experience. I've been on the school board now for 15 years, elected over and over again by my constituents because of the great job that I do for them. I've been chair of the board and uh, in charge of a $1.5 billion budget uh, as their budget chair, balancing that year after year. I've also uh, been on a, a consumer advocate on the new home warranty board, uh, as well as the public library board and vice president of the Ontario Public School Boards Association. But most importantly, I'm from around here. I raised my kids right here in York Region, and I've been living here for almost a quarter of a century. It's, um, that's important because when I bump into you at the IGA or um, the Sobeys or, or the Home Hardware, uh, we, we talk about the local issues. And from all those conversations that we've had over the years, I developed a local plan. And that plan is twofold. It is about transportation improvement and it is about investing in our public institutions. Under transportation, we need to continue to invest in the GO train and the parking to go with it. We need to have more and more service on the Berry Line. 
We need to also uh, do the, the Bradford uh, link between the 400 and the 404. That has to get done. That's something I've been advocating for for, for about five years now, and I'm happy to say it's on the plan. We, and in uh, our uh, institutions that we need to invest in, we need not one, but three new public elementary schools, as well as a high school and a hospital to serve South Simcoe. The cuts that Doug Ford is talking about will not allow us to build these much needed uh, public um, institutions in, the, in this rapidly growing area. We need a local experienced candidate with a local plan to get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Is it all right if I stay seated? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the Bradford Board of Trade for hosting the event this evening. Uh, as your progressive conservative candidate in York Simcoe, I've met so many wonderful people of diverse backgrounds and experiences across the riding. Every person has a story to tell, and more importantly, a dream that they're building. I hear from farmers who are feeding not only our communities, but the world. I hear from doctors and nurses who are working to heal the sick. I hear from shopkeepers, mechanics, carpenter, carpenters, landscapers, manufacturers, seniors groups, and youth advocates. And I hear from families. Unfortunately, what I hear is breaking my heart. They are struggling to build their dreams in Kathleen Wynne's Ontario. Under the Liberal Watch, our hydro bills have gone up by more than 400%. Young people are giving up their dream of owning a home. Seniors are worried they won't get the care they need and deserve. Do you remember when Ontario was once the engine of Canada's economy? Well, those days are long gone. Ontario is now a have-not province. Other candidates here tonight think that it's okay to continue on this path of reckless spending and burdening future generations. But I hear every day in Bradford and across York Simcoe that people don't think this is okay anymore. People are worried about where it will lead us. They worry about paying their bills. They want government to get out of their way and stop making life so hard. Which is why the PC party has a plan to do just that. We're gonna clean up the hydro mess, put money back into your pockets, restore trust and accountability in government, bring jobs back to Ontario, and work with frontline workers to heal our ailing healthcare system. We all want a better Ontario today and tomorrow. But to do that, we need a representative and a government with vision that goes beyond the next election. That is the vision people tell me they expect from their MPP. It's a vision I share and one I will stand up for at Queen's Park every day. Thank you. Mr. Gasco, you know the rules about showing up late. Where's the rest of the class? Coffee? Okay. So, uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, Bradford Board of Trade for inviting us for this debate. I believe that the democracy should be alive, and without you, it wouldn't be a democracy. So, I'm uh, the candidate, libertarian, the candidate for on uh, behalf of the Libertarian Party of Ontario. And what I want to say is, we Ontario at the current moment it's in a very bad situation, financially. Everybody at this table will claim we can fix it, we just do a little tweak. Now the question is, can those structures be fixed in the current framework? Is it possible at all? Has anybody asked this question? What we want to do is, we want to provide alternative frameworks. We want to provide uh, a private involvement of private sector in places where the government has monopoly. Everybody knows monopolies are wasteful and very slow and they don't react to market, to, uh, to market uh, situation. Yet private enterprises are much leaner, they operate much faster and with a be much better outcome. Thank you very much. Mr. Lott. Thank you very much for being here. Yep. Um, the Trudeau Party is not going to be the ruling government at the end of this election. It's not going to be the, the opposition. In fact, if we elect three or three or more seats, it will uh, make the front page of every newspaper in Canada. But what York Simcoe needs is someone who's going to stand up for you. And 
Most of you have never heard of me. In fact, I'd be surprised if anyone here did know me. I'm the eldest son of Jack, who was a merchant seaman during World War II. My mother worked during the war for the master spy William Stevenson, the man actually known as the man from Intrepid. I remember jokingly asking my mother if she worked in the Sex for Secrets division. <laughs> the back of my father's hand told me it wasn't funny. <laughs> until, until the age of 11, we lived in a cottage in Stony Creek. No running water, no toilet. We had an outhouse, 24-7, 12 months a year. I grew up playing hockey on frozen ponds. That was my only comparison to Bobby Orr. My agreement with the Detroit organization ended in a 1966 rookie camp. It may be hard to believe, but I was a scrawny kid back then, often bullied, but I learned to fight back. And fight back I did. In 76, I was hired by Transamerica Commercial Corporation, an industrial lender, where I learned the intricacies of accounting, something the liberals haven't done yet. <coughs> Later, I was recruited by Triad Financial Services and became responsible for everything east of the Ottawa River. Later, I established my own company and had 32 employees when it was sold in the 90s. My real estate career followed, and in 2001, I earned the highest annual sales award for a REMAX agent. My history has largely been one of success built upon a foundation of hard work, dedication, and never quitting. That's who I am, and that's where I'm from. Thank you, David. How the other David? I'll be Dave. He's uh, David. Super Dave. Uh, Thank you very much. First off, let me offer Ramadan Mubarak to anyone who is recognizing this today. 80% of uh, voters are repeatedly telling pollsters in this province that they want to change from the Liberals. And between Horvath and Ford, there couldn't be more of a stark contrast. The NDP sees social programs as critical to our prosperity. Ford's team use them as costs to be cut. The time is right for an NDP government. We have the chance to fulfill a dream. We are fulfilling a dream of completing Medicare in Ontario to include pharmacare and dental care. 25% of Ontarians cannot afford to have their prescriptions filled and their teeth fixed. I suspect the percentage is higher in our communities. The NDP, Pharmacare and Dental Insurance make economic sense because a universal, single buyer Pharmacare program, buying in bulk, would drive down the cost of prescriptions. Only the NDP is promising to do this. We need to make life more affordable for our residents. How? We will cut hydro bills by 30%. We will do this by ending the oversupply of hydro sold off at less than what it costs us to produce. We will do this by bringing Hydro One back into public hands. Our ancestors had the wisdom to recognize that electricity was not a luxury, but an essential service to raise the standard of living of all. And that's why they made it a public company. The NDP will reduce housing costs by creating 65,000 new affordable homes and by a crackdown on housing speculators by extending a non-resident tax on home purchases. We will allow seniors to defer property taxes Thank until you. they sell their home. And only an NDP government can get these good things done. Thank you for that. Nice of you to come along, Julia. You hit really well at the back.
speak of the devil and always shows up. So, hi, Julia. Hi, John. So now we're going to get into uh, the questions. Gentlemen, there's lots of chairs at the back. You're making some people uncomfortable, especially uh, a few of you back there standing taller rocks. That's all. Don't scare people. First question. This one's going to start with Carolyn. Uh, will you commit to working with municipal government to bring the Highway 400, 404 link? And what would you do to get your government to start work on it? Will you propose? for it to be included in the 2019 budget for Ontario. Thank you. That, I think, is probably the most important facing Bradford West Willembury. It's the question I get the most. I'm sure it's the question we all get the most. And I certainly will advocate for uh, the building of the connecting link. Uh, I note that uh, it was a PC government that uh, had the environmental assessment conducted and it was approved. Uh, and it was a Liberal government that removed it. Um, it is essential uh, that we do more than just include it in plans, but that we also include the funds required to get it built. So while it is currently in the Greater Golden Horseshoe Plan, it was just put in, it is not on Infrastructure Ontario's list of funded programs. And so I will certainly work very hard to advocate for this. It's the number one infrastructure priority in BWG, and it is something that I commit to doing as MPP for York Simcoe. Uh, hi, yes, definitely I will. I will advocate for the construction of the link. You need this to be able to transport goods and people across, which is a, it's, been, it's been a problem for a very long time. And I realize that people need this for a long time, so uh, yes, I would advocate and commit to build this uh, Thank you. I would definitely agitate for the uh, construction of that highway. I've been a um, resident of Bradford, a property owner in Bradford, and a property owner in Barrie, uh, as, as well as um, the Newmarket area and Sutton area. And I know the difficulties in traveling from, from Barrie into uh, all of these regions without that highway. That highway will add um, certainly employment opportunities for many, many people. Uh, going both ways, and I think it's uh, it definitely should be done. And I would strongly support it. Okay. Sir, is it possible for the candidates to stand up because we can't see them when we're seated? Absolutely. The request from the floor, unsolicited, is that you guys all stand. So, please do comment. The, um, I do congratulate the uh, members of Bradford uh, Town Council for their excellent lobbying work and making sure that we all know about the importance of this issue to the town of Bradford. I also can assure you that as a member of Georgina Council for three terms, while I was uh, served as Ward 3 representative, we also see in that side of the water the need for the linkage between the 400 and the 404. Those are the only uh, major highways we have in the province 400 series highways that go such a great distance without a firm link between them. In order to facilitate the growth in, uh, in employment lands on both sides of the bay, we need that linkage to carry on. And I totally support that for that reason, as well as to take a lot of the uh, traffic pressure off the town of Bradford in itself. Right now, people driving here tonight realize how difficult it is sometimes to get in here when people are using uh, the street just as they're accessing the 400. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is a great question. This is something that uh, most of you know I've been advocating for for about five years now. And I'm very pleased to have worked uh, with Mayor Keffer and uh, the members of, of the BWG Council to uh, connect them with people in government that can uh, make this happen and we've been successful in getting it put on the growth plan which I think is, is it shows the effectiveness of uh, knowing how to work in government and that comes with years of experience. I've, I've worked uh, with the Mayor and Council on this because I sit on that, in that same traffic that you do and have for years. Uh, whenever I have to get from EG to, to Bradford we sit on Highway 11 or on Green Lane and uh, I know firsthand how badly we need that. 
and I think it's, it's very rich coming from uh, my, my colleague to the left uh, about how important this is when she didn't weigh in on it until half an hour before the debate. And I'm very disappointed in that because that's something when I hear Doug Ford saying cuts, 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 I was hoping that the local candidate would stand up for the local municipality and say, no, we need to invest. We need to invest in our growing communities. And Thank one you. of the things we need is that link. Thank you. And I'm sensing a one minute rebuttal. Yes, well, uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, express uh, how important this is to, uh, to me as a candidate, to members of council and members of the community many, many times. I just put it on Facebook, but uh, it's, uh, it's something I've been able to do face-to-face uh, face -face with people for some time now. Um, I think that uh, it's clear that the Liberal government has had 15 years to make this a priority. It has been a priority for this area now for almost three decades. And so while the Liberals have been in office for 15 years, uh, they took it off the plan uh, when the PC, after the PC party, the PC government put it back on in, in 2002. So the Liberals chose to remove it and, and only just a few short months before an election put it back on the, on the growth plan. But it's not the same as putting in the capital plan because it doesn't have the funding associated with it. Uh, and so that is what I will advocate for. As part of a PC government, we will ad I will advocate as the MPP for this riding to make sure that not only does it stay in the plan, but it's in the capital plan. Dave, but there is a heavy irony with the announcement by your leader today, um, uh, Doug Ford, that they're going to cut the road tax on gasoline to cut the, uh, the feet under any projects that anyone can propose for developing new roads and new infrastructure not only cripple municipalities who depend upon the road tax transfer portion to support local infrastructure, bridges, roads, etc. You, you can't cut all the infrastructure spending and all funding for roads and then say, we're, well, we might be able to build this one. We don't want a cow path connecting 400 and 404. We need a four-lane highway. like to jump in on that road tax. As far as I know, CAA was fighting with the government about five, five, six years ago, so that the road tax that's included in the gasoline to be applied to roads and not used for something else. Can you guarantee it's not going to be happening? Uh, yeah, I, I can't respond. Sorry, David. Yeah, no. <laughs> so I thought you're up. Who's got their phone on? Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sure that uh, Doug Van Luke will pay your $25 for that one. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. You know, we can talk about committees after committee and plan after plan after plan, but in reality what we need is someone who's going to stand up in the legislature and ask the embarrassing questions and to ensure that that Highway link is at the top of the priority because I'm quite sure that over the next four years of any government that uh, there won't be a, a stoppage in road construction. And it'll continue. And uh, this particular stretch of highway has got to get to the top of the list. And for that, you need someone who's going to be prepared to fight. Thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, it shows a, a lack of understanding of the history here to wonder why uh, it wasn't uh, on, the, on the plan earlier. Uh, East Willembury, part of York Simcoe, was opposed to it. Um, and that's why uh, the government wasn't proceeding. It wasn't until uh, BWG and EG both formed a partnership to advocate for this um, that the government saw that it, it was uh, both sides of the community wanted. We had a number of people in EG who were afraid of the land that it would go over and uh, were very concerned about that and there's a, there a number of environmental assessments that went into it. So that's the history and that's why it's important to have someone from here who understands the history of this. Um, and the other thing that, that I want to say is I've spoken to my leader about it. I've been advocating as a candidate for this, for my community, uh, and uh, I would wonder, uh, Caroline, if you have been talking to Doug about this, because the messages that are coming out of him are cutting infrastructure, and it doesn't sound like he would put this on his plan. Thank you. Yeah. So, 
for those of you keeping score. We're on to question number two. So this is for you. Small businesses are currently struggling under soaring rental fees, hydro rates, and increased stocking costs without the deep pockets of large corporations. What specifically would you and your party plan to do to support small business, meaning those under 20 staff members? First of all, small businesses have been heavily hit with this latest minimum wage increase. And I know, I realize that in some situations, yes, you need to have this. However, just a blanket minimum wage across the province does not work. And the reason why it doesn't work is because the costs are different. In Toronto, you're going to need a lot more money to be able to live than in Thunder Bay or another place. So what, what, what I think it should be fair is let adults negotiate whatever they need to negotiate in terms of wages and let municipalities take care of their, in, in, um, according to the local conditions, take care of the minimum wage. And in terms of electricity, we are going to provide a framework that will allow competition. We know competition will drop prices and usually you get a much better service if you have competition. Look at, look, look at your phone bill. Your phone bill is constantly decreasing in the last time, as opposed to your electricity bill where it's a monopoly and it keeps going up. Thank you. David. Thank you. As, a, uh, as an entrepreneur myself, way back when, I, I understand the challenges that are faced by business owners, particularly when you, you're the one taking the risk, you're the one that's uh, got your wife or husband who's co-signing the loan at the bank, and you've got that uh, mortgage on your house as collateral to uh, generate 30% of your inventory in a credit line. I think the first thing I do is to start removing some of the 390,000 uh, restrictions and regulations that face business. And there's so many. As a matter of fact, there's uh, about four on how to walk, stand up on a ladder. I'd, uh, as far as electricity is concerned, the government certainly wouldn't want me because I would take five lawyers down to the legislature, I'd put them in one room, conference room, I'd hand them copies of that Green Energy Act, that hydro contract, and I'd lock the door. I'd send in pizza and Chinese food until they came up with four Thank different you. ways out, and I'd do the same thing with four law students or five law students in another room. Thank you. You're up, Dave. We have to recognize that small businesses are the main job creators in this country. That is where the essential workforce comes from, and we have to support that as any kind of rational, financial, and job creation plan. The assistance that we're talking about giving for small business right now, number one, cutting the hydro rates, I already said by 30%. Also within that, eliminating the time of day charge uh, surplus is going to go on that. We're penalizing small business and charging them a higher rate for when they have to be open to do their business. Secondly, we're going to maintain the one-third reduction uh, to small business corporate uh, tax rate to assist the small businesses on the overall tax. Um, uh, what I ask you to do, we printed off a special part of our program on small support for small business in the back. Grab one of those flyers, please, if you particularly want more on what we're going to do with small business. Thank you. Uh, this is an issue uh, that's near and dear to me. My uh, sister and her, her husband have a small business. Uh, my partner has a small business. And I see how it affects them. And it's something that we definitely need to be doing more on. Uh, so far, we have uh, the Liberal government has decreased small business taxes by 22% to help offset uh, the, the increase in minimum wage. The increase in minimum wage is, is what people deserve. They deserve a living wage. But we need to help our small businesses at the same time. So we're doing that. We also have the rent control that's in place that Doug Ford's talking about scrapping. This is going to greatly affect our small businesses that rent their premises. Uh, we also have in place uh, all the, the social safety net of, of uh, 
uh, free prescriptions for children uh, and daycare and, and uh, lots of programs like that that help people to make ends meet. And whether you're a small business or you're struggling to get by, these programs will continue to help you and uh, Doug's Ford wants to cut them. I think that uh, when we talked about regulations, I think we just have to look back to uh, Harris to remember what happens when you start cutting uh, and uh, regulations. Thank you. Well, small business owners are the lifeblood of our economy, and uh, and it, you know they could be small farms, uh, small business owners working from their homes, small manufacturers. But regardless of what kind of industry they're in. Uh, they're all facing huge challenges that are coming from our provincial government. Uh, the biggest challenge that we've got to face, focus on is reducing hydro rates. Hi skyrocketing hydro rates are making it harder for small businesses to be profitable, to pay their employees, to make ends meet. Uh, red tape, the sky, the sky, there are over, as David said, over 380,000 regulations that small businesses have to comply with. Big businesses have huge departments that are, uh, that are dedicated to handling this, but for small businesses, this is crushing. Um, and in the farming industry, they have to deal with 29 different provincial ministries and 15 different federal ministries. I mean, they, they spend more time in chairs than on the fields, which is where they want to be. So the real thing that we need to do for small businesses, which this Liberal government has not done, is we need a change in philosophy. We need to let small businesses know that we want them to succeed and that we are here for them to help them do that. David. You know, all these people stand up here and they talk about reducing hydro rates. But folks, give your head a shake. We're not reducing hydro rates, we're deferring them. That's what we're doing. We're pushing them on to our grandchildren and their grandchildren and their grandchildren. That's all we're doing. Because if we've got a 25 year or 20 year contract where we're paying 79 or 80 cents a kilowatt hour, okay, we're selling this stuff for six cents, then figure it out. There's nobody in this room who would want to go in business with anyone else and we buy chairs that you're sitting on for 80 bucks and sell them for six. I mean, we wouldn't last too long, would we? So until you get rid of the contract that you've got where you're buying this electricity for the next 20 years, you're not saving that dime. You're just pushing it on to the next generations. And that's what makes me sick. And I just want to be really clear what Dave is referring to there is maybe the Liberal plan of deferring the operating expenses, the consumption of electricity down the road for future generations, adding uh, $40 billion, as the Auditor General was saying, to the overall hydro bill we're passing on to the next generations. What the New Democratic Party is saying is that we put a stop to the high prices and gouging of hydro by buying back Hydro One. So we're not paying money into the profits of, private of a private corporation and utilizing that money in order to help further reduce the, the cost of hydro. That's what we need to do, regain hydro control over Hydro One, and in the long term then we've maintained control over that corporation and are able to maintain reasonable costs for it. The other thing that we want to help with with, with, with um, small business is by having a universal health care plan in place that covers all aspects of health, including pharmacare and dental care, that's a great help for small business. <laughs> business. <laughs> How are you going to buy back hydro? The government has less than 50% in its share. Are you going to, going to pay market price for the current shares? Does that mean that we sold it? Cheap and now we buy it back expensive. Worth less now than it was. Da, 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 da. So I think again, this is uh, an area where a little bit of uh, knowledge of, of the file goes a long ways. When we are selling it cheap, it's because it's being generated by something uh, like nuclear that can't be shut down overnight. Uh, that hydro is being generated, and if it's not being used, better to get six cents than nothing. Right, so so that's where that's coming from, and people like to, to twist that out of control. Um, I think the other thing that's important is the buying back of hydro will lower bills. The, hydro is is the prices are regulated by an independent regulator. The buying of hydro will do nothing to your bill. Uh, Doug Ford firing the CEO will do nothing for your hydro bill. 
Uh, these, are, these are slogans that they want to throw out there, but the reality is to understand how Hydro works, the, it's, the rates are set by an independent uh, uh, regulator and the, the firing of the CEO does nothing. The buying back of the shares does nothing. Uh, the investments that we made because of the selling of a, a portion of Hydro One have built the infrastructure that we need. We hear from people that we need infrastructure and we need money to do that. Thank you. You get the final shot. Well, I think uh, it's pretty clear that uh, what will not help our hydro bills is another four years of Liberal government. Um, but what we need, as I said earlier, what we need to focus on is how we are going to help small businesses. We are going to reduce their hydro rates, and we're going to do it by working with, uh, by, as we said, scrapping the Green Energy Act and trying to undo some of these long-term contracts. But the biggest thing is we are going to work with small businesses and let them know that we are there for them. Uh, Bill 148 brought in some important uh, legislation that's helpful to a lot of people. But in 2014, the Liberals had the opportunity to raise the minimum wage and they chose to index it to inflation. And so when they did bring it in eventually, it took so many small businesses by surprise that it hurt the people that it wanted to help in the first place. And that's what I mean. We need to partner with small businesses, let them know what we want to do as a government to help all of us in society, other people in society, but work with them because they can only pass on their costs so much. And so a conservative PC uh, government two. will do that and help small businesses. Thank you all. I'm sorry that I have to do that all the time. You guys get on a good roll and I just have to enforce the time. Question three. Due to growth in this area, our schools are often overcrowded. Our children are missing out on special programs like French Immersion gym and library time and are sitting in portables rather in rather than inside the brand new schools how do you plan to address this david that starts with you schools are uh, probably the most important thing for young children in their uh, initial growth and uh, I think what we have to do is make sure that when we're starting to build suburban infrastructure and subdivisions here, there, and everywhere, that we make we make it possible for schools to be readily accessible for the children. And if that means that we're going to build more schools, then we build more schools. It's as simple as that, uh, which will alleviate the, the overcrowding problem. We also have to make sure that we've got the teachers and the infrastructure in order to, to handle that. And as a... As a uh, as your representative in York Simcoe, uh, I will make sure that we have just exactly that, proper schools and proper teaching and proper facilities for the kids. Thank you. Dave, you're up. The province has a, is right now has a dislocation of the schools. Clearly, with the expansion of population here in the Bradford West Country area, we need to build more schools to accommodate that growth. It goes without saying. We, though, have to at the same time, the second part of the question to me is, is more key. How do we ensure that we have the proper supports within those schools? We're committed to increasing the number of educational assistants uh, within the schools and increase the number of special ed teachers that have been cut back over the recently over by the Liberal governments in order to maintain supports for programs providing mental health supports to our students. This will go a long way towards reducing, reducing the problem of violence within our schools. We need to address those needs of those young people, identify and address the needs before they become critical problems. We will do away with unnecessary programs in the educational system using the money from the EQAO, which has proven not to in any way achieve the goals it set out to do and uh, in monitoring. Thank you. Lots of education, lots of education. Do I get an extra minute? No. <laughs> okay, that's why I put on my plan that we need three new schools in Bradford. Um, it's, it's so essential, but I want to talk for a minute about portables, because what a lot of people don't know, and I have 15 years as a trustee, uh, and part of the area I represented included Richard Stovall, when they went through all that growth. And people ask, why is there portables within a couple of years of the school opening up? And here's why. Schools are funded over 25 years, just like your mortgage. 
and we get funding, the school board gets funding uh, per student that's in there. When a school opens up a new subdivision, it's all young families with young kids. Those elementary schools are filled to capacity and then over capacity, but as time goes by, the, the neighborhood matures, the kids get older, they move on to high school, and that elementary school em empties out. If the, those portables weren't in place, then we would have a half-empty school that we'd have to shut down. And that's not good use of tax dollars. So that's why it's important to really understand these issues and the rationale behind them. Portables are necessary short-term solutions as the, the population ebbs and flows so that we're not building unnecessary uh, buildings. Thank you. Well, as the second fastest growing municipality in Ontario after Milton, uh, Bradford faces uh, great, great challenges as a result of this growth. And in education, that has been one of the biggest in addition to, obviously, uh, congestion and the, and the connecting link. Uh, and so making sure that we can keep up with this growth and educate students in the, in, in, at the levels that they need is key. We need to work closely with our municipalities so that we are providing them with the infrastructure that they need. In terms of classrooms, we need to make sure that they've got the resources they need in the classrooms and that we need, in terms of education, that we are focused on what kids need, which is we need to make sure that we're, we're improving math skills. Our students are not doing well in math. We need to work with get, getting get more math resources in math um, and, and uh, focus on declining math scores in Ontario. Uh, I realize how important schools are for early education and everything else. Yet our party, what will provide, will provide an alternative framework where individual players, alternative players, not government managed, will follow and will fill in the gaps. Let me explain to you just a little bit the Swedish school system. What's happening there is, what they instituted, and it's been like in 1992, I think, and it works very well. Every student gets a voucher. You can take that voucher, go to any school where you, you want, doesn't matter where it is, they have to accept you and they have to provide the education for you. And this will alleviate some of the problems that are like, you cannot take your kid and, and go and, and get him into the other school because the law will not allow you. Why not? Why is that so important? Plus this creates inequality. Because if you have a, a better school, the housing is more expensive in that area. I experienced that myself in Toronto. Thank you. I'm sensing my models. Going once. David. You led the pack. You get another shot. You know, if the Minister of Education was as interested in looking after the math scores as they were with the sex education program, maybe we'd be a lot better off. <laughs> Dave wants a shot first. <laughs> yeah, I can't let that just go, David. <laughs> the Ontario schools consistently perform among the best in the world on the PISA rating, which is the gold standard of any kind of testing. The ability to now do a program, a comprehensive health education program, that allows uh, young people to learn concepts of um, consent and concepts of uh, understanding and acceptance of, of various uh, other peoples is a part of an overall healthy development of an individual. Um, this focus on, on less than 10% of the, of the new curriculum is, is really misplaced and coming from a bad orientation, I suspect. Thank you. First of all, I have to stand up for our gay teenagers in our schools and say that that kind of comment uh, is, is ignorant and inappropriate. We have had that uh, curriculum in our schools for many years now. I have spoken with hundreds and hundreds of parents about it, and once you actually read it, you'll find out it's keeping our kids safe and protecting lives, and that is so important. I'm sorry, I get really emotional about this because I see what happens in our schools when we don't have accepting schools. So I, I, I'm offended by that comment. Uh, the other point
point about more resources than that? Well, we did put more resources than that, and that didn't work. So the plan now, if you go back and you look at the research, you look at what's happened with the math curriculum, we have invested in literacy. Literacy was a big focus. We hired teachers who were experts in literacy, and that's when the math scores went down. So more resources are gonna, isn't going to help that. What we need is teachers who are trained experts in teaching math. And that is what we are working on now. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm rolling my eyes at all this talk here about investing in infrastructure that uh, Caroline says we need schools and we need roads. And yet her, her leader is saying that we're going to cut these things back. Yeah. Yeah. We are trailing behind the other provinces in Canada and 50% of our grade 6 students are not passing provincial standards. And so we need to do that. Uh, we need to get rid of the fad of discovery math. We need to go back to some of the basics and make sure that our teachers who are instructing our students in math have the appropriate, the necessary background, the necessary tools to, 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 teach, uh, to teach math to our kids. Uh, and so that's what we need to do. We need to, do, we need to go back to those basics. Hey, so I'm going to puzzle me a bit. You said we need more teachers. On the other hand, Lately, a lot of teachers are only hired on a contract basis. Why? Well, nobody will ever know because this round of questions is ended. <laughs> Ironically enough, sometimes I just do things to screw up the whole lineup in the system. This is a one minute, one minute, no rebuttal, be nice question. Because it's from a young voter. Yeah, I try and be nice too, it's a struggle. What will your party do to assure that York Simcoe's large First Nations population are consulted in regards to projects such as the Upper York Sewage Plant and the 400-404 lane? That's not you, Dave. You're up first. One minute. Um, I'm really glad I got that question because it's personally I've been engaged in the issue around the Upper York Sewage Solution for a number of years since it was fruit, we first heard of it. And they didn't allow for hearings in Georgina, let alone hearings with the First Nations. We were able to get engaged with some of the First Nations principal people on the uh, Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation, and they are now one of the leading uh, opponents of this uh, project because they have not been thoroughly consulted. This government did not properly consult with the First Nations before trying to impose the dumping of 40 million liters a day of treated sewage into Lake Simcoe. 40 million liters containing phosphorus and, and pharmaceuticals and personal care products. So we have a comprehensive plan, the NDP, for writing relationships with our First Nations. We seek to pursue those. Foremost among that is the consultation, the respect for it, going on. I called up Donna Big Canoe on the island the other day to ask for permission. May I come over and speak to people? Thank you. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of fear mongering down there that uh, Upper York uh, Sewage Solution has not reached final approval. They are still consulting and one of the groups they need to consult with is the First Nations. I believe it should have been done sooner, uh, but it will be done, and it, mu and it must be done. As chair of the York Region School Board, I brought in the land acknowledgement for our First Nations because I think we all need to understand the land that we are on and uh, who, who our treaties are with and have more respect for our First Nations. I, I would not be in favor of an Upper York sewage solution that uh, uh, was not in consultation with the Chippewas of Georgina Island. And I think that is it's just so, so important. I think we need to be careful with the fear-mongering and trying to get political points um, by, by misstating the facts. Thank you. Well, I think that Lake Simcoe is probably the greatest asset that we have in York Simcoe, and uh, ensuring its protection above all is something that matters to everyone, and in particular it does to the Chippewas of Georgina Island, who look seven generations ahead. And so that affects, that it applies to Lake Simcoe and it applies to uh, the issues involved with the connecting link. Uh, in the case of the Upper York Sewage, the Upper York Sewage System, uh, uh, Donna Canoe has asked for uh, a couple of other additional uh, environmental assessments. And unfortunately, the funding has not come through for that. And so while nobody wants to see a project of this magnitude, of this importance to the area, uh, delayed and of this cost, 
delayed, we have to make sure that we do this right uh, and that we protect Lake Simcoe, that we do everything we can to do that, uh, as well as uh, with respect to uh, the connecting link. Thank you. I realize how important Lake Simcoe is for, um, for the Chaws uh, uh, region, for the Georgian Island region. So I would, uh, I would make sure that all the parties involved are consulted and make sure that everybody understands exactly, exactly what is involved. I'm a software engineer by, by definition, so I'm speaking on facts only. That's it. For me, what's on the paper, that's what it counts. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about ideology or anything else. So first of all, to be able to accommodate everybody, I'll get all the parties involved talking and then hopefully they will find a solution amongst themselves. You will not need an external factor to push them one way or the other. I'm sure of it. Thank you, Jeanette. Very cooperative question. Next coming up is healthcare. Oh, I'm sorry, David, I didn't mean to miss you. Uh, it happens all the time. I, uh, I met with Bill McHugh, uh, who is on the uh, band of the Chippewas about six weeks ago, and I can tell you that they're very, very concerned. Uh, Bill's also a member of the golf club where I play golf, and so I also play golf with him uh, several, well, actually many times a year. But they're very concerned with the 40 million liters of, of water that's going every day into uh, Lake Simcoe and the phosphorus content that will uh, harm the uh, cold deep water fish, which they use and rely upon. So um, I think we have to look at at both that and the issues that we have with protecting the uh, provincially significant wetlands along the uh, shoreline and ensure that those aren't putting phosphorus into the lake as well. Thank you. Thank you. Since we've raised it a number of times here, question. And that would be a yes, no, probably with a statement, probably with a rebuttal, probably with the entire thing. So, are you in favor of the carbon tax? And we're back to you. Excellent. So, the carbon tax is federal. Whether we're in favor of it or not uh, is irrelevant. It's coming from the federal government, and what we need to do is find the best way for Ontario to benefit from it. And right now, the carbon tax is not being downloaded on you as consumers. It is uh, being set, uh, uh, levied on our most, our biggest polluters, and uh, they are allowed to, to trade uh, credits so that uh, they, other companies can reduce. So through our uh, cap and trade program, we have been able to invest in retrofitting our schools so they're greener, and in building more uh, transit, like the GO train. These are the things that cap and trade will fund. It's coming, whether you like it or not, uh, the carbon tax. So let's find the best way to use it. And liberals are the only ones with a solid plan that benefits uh, us as consumers and, and residents in Ontario. I've already got my Nest thermostat that's paid for by Cap and Trade. You can go to Green On and uh, click on that, and uh, they'll come to your home and, and uh, do a, an energy audit and let you know whether you need new windows or a new furnace and show you the credits for that. And that's all thanks to Cap and Trade. Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm not in favor of the carbon tax. The carbon tax is a revenue generating mechanism for the federal government. It is not it is not gonna help the environment. In order to actually to produce the kinds of change in behavior that it says it's going to, you'd have to raise it at such a level that it would be un, un, unaffordable by anybody. Uh, Ontarians are already paying too much in tax. We will scrap the cap and trade, which will take four and a half percent, four and a half cents off your your gas bill. Uh, we also announced today that we're going to reduce uh, gas prices by ten cents a liter. Uh, but no, I am not in favor of the carbon tax. Uh, we need to work with uh, industries and with people to change behavior to have environmental benefits. But it does not start by adding more to the tax burden of uh, Ontarians who are already overburdened by tax. No, I'm totally against carbon tax. Uh, I realize the importance of green energy and green initiatives. Yet, they have to be done wisely and they have to be done in a manner that will not affect it too much. 
I know that about, only about 30% of the carbon tax money are really going where they're supposed to be. The rest are just siphoned off to other programs. Why? And the fact that, uh, as Laura Lee said, uh, the producer will not pass this tax on to the consumer. Are you sure? Are you sure it's not already in the price of the goods you're buying? I'm not. I'm totally opposed to the carbon tax. I want to uh, tell you one thing. Canada's carbon footprint, according to the United Nations, is 1.5%, 1.56% of the world total. That's less than international shipping, which is 1.9. Ontario's carbon footprint is 0.46% of the world total. If Ontario shut down completely, it wouldn't mean a thing in the big picture. So I'm totally opposed to it. And if someone tells you that that money that's being paid in the cap and trade isn't going into the cost of the goods that you're buying, and I'm sorry, but there's a big mistake. Every single thing in this room has got a carbon footprint someplace in its manufacture or its distribution. And those businesses aren't going to suck that up and take it off their bottom line. They're going to pass it along, plus another 10%. The NDP sees supporting greenhouse gas reduction emissions as essential to fighting climate change. We support the cap and trade to move forward in that direction to a zero carbon future, but we need to do a just transition. We do need, the problem we have with the current way it's being administered is the lack of transparency and the lack of fairness. What we want to see is 25% of the cap and trade revenues be taken and put into supporting individuals and communities that have disproportionate burdens as a consequence of the high prices. Plus, we need to mandate the Ontario Energy Board to monitor the price of gasoline across Ontario to advise on policies to adjust where the to address where there is price volatility and disproportionate um, burdens there. Thanks. Um, so cap and trade's been in place for a year. We have not seen the uh, skyrocketing prices that uh, the fear mongers to my left are, are going on about. Uh, we have we have seen, and it's it's charged. Uh, so the four cents uh, that uh, Caroline's talking about is not per liter. So I mean, let's get our facts straight on this. But the most important thing is, I hope you all remember where cap and trade started with Caroline's father, right? With acid rain. So I would like to know whether Caroline's standing with her father and his cap and trade that helped reduce acid rain or with her leader, Doug Ford, who wants to scrap it. I'm very proud of my father's environmental legacy. He's Canada's greenest prime minister, and so I'm very proud of that. But I can tell you, Laura Lee, that uh, the job of a, of a provincial government is to stand up for what's right for the people of the province of Ontario. Uh, and you alluded earlier, you said earlier, uh, that it's a federal program and it's coming whether we like it or not, and that's not the case. The case is that we need to stand up for what's right for the people of Ontario. Uh, people are suffering, they've become so unaffordable as a result of liberal policies over the last 15 years. Uh, and to take on and accept another tax is unconscionable. People live in rural ridings, they're driving trucks, they're commuting, and they just can't get around that. We have got to make life, we've got to do everything we can to make life more affordable and not accept another tax. Uh, here I, con I concur with Caroline. Who says that we as a provincial government, we cannot go even if, let's say, it would be federal, it will come or not. Who says that we shouldn't go back to the federal government, shake the ivory tower and say, hey, why do that? I was, I was reading this morning, I was uh, looking at some graphs uh, in New York Times actually, and they had projections for carbon, uh, carbon projections. And you know what I, uh, what I saw there? For Canada, the, the, what Canada committed to do was something like this and the graph going down. What China committed to do on the opposite side for the future was something like this and the graph going up. Why? 
Why is the federal government not taking any position on that? You know, it's funny that the three places where you have cap and trade, California, Ontario, Quebec, the three jurisdictions that are most indebted in entire North America, they're up to their eyeballs in debt. And so they use the very nice thought of uh, green and the green and the green, and this is uh, the excuse to raise the taxes. Now there's a guy in California who's buying carbon credits. He doesn't use them all because he's having a, a slow year or whatever. And then there's a fellow in, a, in Ontario and he's, he's using more than he needs. So what's he doing? He's buying them from the guy in California. So guess where your tax dollars are going? You're paying for the extra carbon in the production of every single thing, and that money's going to that guy in California. Welcome to Cap and Trade. Uh, yeah, the, the last uh, speaker, my friend David here, gave an interesting scenario, but I don't know where that's actually happening quite that way. That's why we're calling for increased transparency. That's precisely why we're calling for it. Because we don't know what's happening to the funds. We want to take, let's go back to what we're trying to accomplish with this whole goal. We're trying to reduce our overall carbon uh, consumption in the, in the country, in the province. And so cap and trade is one of the methods we can use for that. We want to take, we want to take some of the funds for that and allow the continuation of house retrofitting programs so that individuals and communities can continue to reduce their carbon usage and carbon production. That's what we're about, not arguing back and forth on which form of carbon taxation are we going to accept or fight. Our next question is almost on the same line, only this time it's healthcare. Given that the, there are proposals out for free medication for those under 21, but seniors see an increased cost, seeing as hospitals are consistently operating between 15 and 35% over capacity across the province, seeing as our aging population, everybody over here over 50, the challenge is going to continue to grow. What are you going to do to address the concerns of health care within the province? And this is, yes, a one minute and one minute rebuttal. I will be going for at least 45 minutes. Well, I think everyone here has waited too long in an emergency room or too long for surgery uh, for an MRI, and there are certainly significant deficits in our health care system. Uh, South Lake is uh, has been at uh, over capacity uh, now for almost since 2013 uh, with uh, too few emergency beds for the number of people who are coming. And so the PC plan is to focus, our priority is to focus on wait times. And the way to do that is to look at care across the spectrum. We need to work with our doctors and our nurses, our frontline care, to help alleviate pressures uh, in emergency rooms. We need to build long-term care beds. And so the PC party commits to building 30,000 new long-term care beds. And that'll help move people who are in emergency who need to be in long-term care out of emergency. And we're gonna invest almost $2 billion in mental health, mental health, and that will also help do that. So we, we need this as a priority. Uh, our seniors population will be doubling uh, in the next 25 years. Uh, we need to make the, we need to do this right. Our, <laughs> it's the number one priority for the uh, PC party, and uh, I think it's one of the top priorities for the Ontario government. I believe that by creating alternative structures, that will let the private sector step in, the government burden will be reduced. The same way, instead of just providing a certain amount of money to a certain hospital and they don't have enough money at the end of the year, every, the, the, the amount of money will be tied like, similar like the Swedish school system that I, um, I mentioned earlier, uh, will be tied to the patient. The patient will go and the hospital will, will get the money that are tied to this particular patient. On the other hand, why don't we have enough doctors in the province? Why? What's, what's preventing them from coming in? What's happening? Did anybody ask associations why not? It's not like we don't have enough trained people. As far as I know, the, the um, 
uh, how is it named? the internship positions. They are very limited. They can't even get in. Why? Why is this happening? I don't know. Personally, I don't know all the details. I would have to really Thank dig you. into it and find out. I really think we need to uh, consult with the doctors and consult with the nurses and get their uh, ideas on how to make the system better. I don't think that uh, someone sitting in an ivory tower at Queen's Park has got all the answers. I can tell you that um, I was at the uh, emergency at uh, South Lake several months ago and I sat there and I thought about the $1.2 billion that the Liberal government flushed down the uh, with the uh, gas plants and at the uh, government of uh, at the government of Ontario savings bond rate it worked out to two hundred and twenty thousand dollars a month for each of ten hospitals now think about it two hundred and twenty thousand a month for each of ten hospitals now instead of having three doctors and three nurses running around an emergency room with a lineup that's going out to the front door and a five hour wait from getting in and getting out. Can you imagine what would happen if you went to the hospital and said, look, here's another $220,000 a month in perpetuity as long as you use it. Emergency. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, thank you. Uh, I asked my local pharmacist, I said, Brent, you, you'll know. How many people come in here to get a prescription filled? And then after they see the price of it, say, forget it, I can't take it. And he said, Dave, way more than you can imagine. And plus there's the others who come in and they don't bother getting renewed. They've been cutting their pills in half <coughs> to try to make them last longer. A quarter of our population does not have access to proper pharma care coverage. If we're going to provide an adequate health care system, we've got to include this universally for everyone. Right through the whole age spectrum, right through everyone caught in precarious work situations, for everyone partially unemployed, part-time unemployed, unemployed, we've got to capture this. In the dental field, we waste, I'm going to say, $38 million a year. Save it for your rebuttal. You're Save it for my rebuttal. I'll talk about dead teeth then. Thank you. Laura Lee. Thank you. Um, that's why that hospital for South Simcoe was part of my plan. So these things that have come up over and over again, I have been as part of my plan, and I'm not talking about uh, having no way to fund it. Uh, you can't have it both ways. You can't uh, scrap uh, all taxes and put money back in your pocket and have uh, hospitals and, and have um, uh, uh, schools and infrastructure. Um, we have the best median wait times in Canada. In Ontario here, we have the best median wait times. So there is more to be done, especially in this particular area. Uh, South Lake just got a new MRI, uh, so, so that's wonderful. If you've ever been there for an MRI, you know what the wait time used to be. I've been to South Lake many, many times over the quarter century that I've lived here and with my children. Uh, we, the Liberal government has brought in 6,000 more doctors, 28,000 nurses. Uh, and that's why we have a plan to get people out of the ER who are best serviced somewhere else. We're investing in mental health. Let those people get the service they need outside of the ER. We're investing in long-term care beds and in prescriptions, not just for those under 25, you said 21 is 25, Thank but you. also those over 65. Thank I'm, you. I'm always there. Oh, I'm sensing rebuttals all over the place. Well, the other day I met a, a man who told me that he had taken his mom to a hospital and she waited 24 hours uh, in a hallway. And that, sadly, uh, is more and more common uh, across York Simcoe and across Ontario. Uh, to prioritize health care, what we need to do is we, need to, we have to stop spending money, wasting money where we don't need it. Uh, this government has doubled the size of our debt. And as a result, we are spending a billion dollars a month on to interest expense. A billion dollars would, would build another hospital. And so when we look at how we are going to fund the things that we need in our province, we need to make sure that we're not wasting money 
and spending our hard-earned tax dollars in ways uh, where we don't, places we don't need it. We need to spend it where we do. And that's why we have to stop borrowing money and spending more on interest expense and investing in health care where we need it. I would like to find out since when the government has been the arbiter of you get the treatment or you don't get the treatment. Like I know, I know enough cases where it has happened that per, it was a sick person, they wanted to get a certain treatment, the government said no, we are not going to approve it. I'm going to pay it out of my own pocket. No, we are not going to approve it. Why? So look at, look at UK. UK has a dual system. It has the public system, it has the private sector. You don't get anything, you don't get the treatment you want or you need or anything else from the public system. You can go to the private sector in, at any time. I lived in Germany for three years. They had the same thing, dual system. Why not? Why do we hang on to all those anachronic structures? David? You know, there's something wrong when a young fella can go to uh, go to his pharmacist and get uh, Viagra paid for by the government and I go in and I have to pay 56 bucks for some eardrops. I guess that tells you where the government's giving it to you. I can't imagine. Is that to work now, Dave? Well, it just goes on to the point about waste in the, in the healthcare system. $38 million dollars in, spent in emergency rooms last year in the province treating dental problems that should have been dealt with before they became strong issues. 220,000 uh, visits to the to local to pharmacy, um, physicians for advanced dental pain that should have been addressed before the causes got so bad. You know, what we are proposing to do is increase hospital funding by 5.3%, return the cuts that have been happened to our hospital system over the last number of years, and we want to keep that funding at the growing at the inflation rate or better. Let's talk about stop wasting money. We will not get into projects like the previous Conservative government did with private public partnerships building hospitals that wound up costing four to five times what it should be costing us if we fund it publicly. Um, I'm gonna make a request just for one second. I don't think. Um, I know that the candidates have some people that are here. If you could come up and get their water bottles refilled and maybe get uh, Sylvia and David a, a coffee or some water, please, that would be greatly appreciated. They're still going to talk for another 40 minutes, and uh, they're getting a little dry mouth, is what I know. So. I'm sorry, there are no breaks. Some of you just asked for a break. No, I'm sorry, there are no toilet breaks for you. So, small bladders are just part of life. Yes. Can you stand up and have a stretch? Yeah, oh, okay, everybody, this is a seventh inning stretch. Everybody up? Uh, big stretches. Touch your toes. Yeah, we're up on Little to the left, let's see that swimming dancing with yoga. Alright, so we have one rebuttal left on the healthcare question. It's yours. You have one minute. Thank you. You have water, correct? Yes, I do. I'm great. I, I, it's an uh, experience you pace yourself, right? Um, so my colleagues here are great at identifying problems, but a little short on the solutions. And that's what we need. Empty slogans are not going to build uh, hospitals for us. It's not going to build the infrastructure that we need. Um, we can't cut our way to prosperity. It's so important that we make investments for our children and our grandchildren to leave Ontario in a better way. That did not happen under last Harris government. And I know you weren't in the province then, but we had uh, children out uh, of school because of, of the strikes. We had blackouts and brownouts constantly. We had an unreliable electrical system because investments weren't made. We owe it to our children to, to maintain our public uh, structure, infrastructure that we have. And uh, that goes for hospitals as well. Thank you. Next question is kind of near and dear to my heart, so it involves the hall on Mars, so thanks. you're going to have to straighten out a little for this one, guys. 
Edible horticulture is the main business in the Holland Marsh. It is a business that relies on the global market to sell its product. We are inundated with red tape from federal, provincial, county, municipal, and conservation regulations. For example, this is the question that comes up. Half of Simcoe runs the marsh. Half of York runs the marsh. First question on that one, would you see an annexation, yes or no? Second, what is your government going to do to help streamline the process to allow farmers to be more competitive in the market and be sustainable? So, that's you. Yes, by, uh, by reducing the regulations and all the red tape uh, put in place by the current government, this will definitely increase productivity and allow farmers to do their work instead of worrying about bureaucratic measures they have to meet, let's say. Thank you. David, did you want to show it? <laughs> Our party's going to do nothing, but I will. Um, we, we, we have to standardize this stuff. I mean, this is just, this is just common sense. One of the things that that we looked at with the 390,000 regulations that's coming. I mean, it covers a lot of businesses, but there are many, many of them that need to be eliminated. Red tape that needs to be eliminated. It's insane for a farmer to have half a half a field that's in York and half a field that's in somewhere else, and he's got to uh, treat his uh, petunias different than he than he treats his marigolds. You know, I mean, this is just this is just common sense. We just gotta put this stuff together, sit down and find out which ones work and which ones don't. And that I'll do. Thank you. Okay. On the first part of the question, but uh, you were talking about annexation. One, I think that's going to call for a, re a referendum by the people who are affected to determine to which jurisdiction they would want to belong or if any other re resolution is required. On terms of re supporting agricultural the agricultural industry here in the marsh, first thing we have to look at is the risk management program which is put in place to protect farmers from fluctuations in local and global markets. Liberals have put an unreasonable cap upon the, that program. We want to raise the cap on the risk management program uh, in order to have a Maine Ontario resolution to the issues created by the variations and fluctuations. We want to further defend any, the supply management uh, program for Ontario farmers. So Ontario farmers are competitive as a group, as well as protecting Ontario's uh, production insurance program. The insurance program that guarantees that uh, catastrophic losses would not be suffered by the individual farmer and allow that uh, coverage to be extended to all crops. Thank you. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, the farmers in the marsh here. It's uh, such an important part of York Simcoe and part of York Simcoe that I'm so, so proud of. I live next to a farmer's field. I have cows across the street from me. Uh, my children's grandparents are farmers. Uh, I know how important farming is. It is the, a huge economic engine of Ontario and we need to look after our farmers. Um, that's why in, uh, with NAFTA, uh, the Premier is looking for uh, uh, increasing markets for uh, oil, grains and seeds, as well as edible horticulture. Ontario has a reputation for safe, quality um, uh, produce, and we need to make sure that that's maintained. I think it's true there's too many regulations, and having two different municipalities involved, uh, two different regions involved, uh, adds to that, and we need to find a way to streamline that, and that would be something that, that should definitely be up for discussion, if that's what the people in the marsh would like. Um, I think uh, our government has helped a lot with risk management. Over $230 million has been spent uh, to help with that, uh, with the fluctuations in climate. It's only going to get worse, and that's why it is so important that uh, we invest in climate change as well. Thank you. Well, I think it would be impossible to overstate the importance of agriculture and the Holland Marsh. Uh, to the local economy, but also to the provincial, the national, and even the global economy. 13% of the world's vegetables are supplied uh, from the Mahalan Marsh. Uh, and they do incredible work under increasingly difficult conditions uh, that are created, have been created more and more by this Liberal government. 
Uh, the fact that annexation is something that has come up uh, just suggests it shows as an example of some of the issues that uh, farmers have to deal with. And so I would certainly want to sit down, work with municipalities, work with the farmers to understand what the issues are that they're trying to resolve. We need to, re we need to reduce red tape. We need to uh, ease the burden that they are dealing with in terms of regulations. But farmers are also struggling under other, from other issues, hydro costs, uh, lack of access to uh, broadband. Uh, we, there's so much that we need to do, but we need to, what the province of Ontario needs to do is prioritize our farmers and make sure we're working with them and supporting them and Thank giving you. them the help that they need. See, we've got water being delivered from the marsh. That's actually marsh water itself. <laughs> After all the federal regulations and hoops, I have a jump through for that. There bloody well better be. Oh, I'm sorry, there's not a federal candidate in here, is there? No, no bureaucrats? Good. Rebuttal time. Anybody? We're all good for farmers? We're happy? Cool. We're going to move on to an environment question then. What will your party do about the environment in the conditions such as Greenbelt Protection, Green Energy, Electric Cars? What will your party do for the environment? And it's David up first. Thank you. I think one of the uh, really significant issues that we have with the Green Belt uh, in particular is the, and, and, and why it's a problem is because as we continue to build on the Green Belt that surrounds Lake Simcoe, we continue to put uh, the opportunity for phosphorus going into the lake and increasing the phosphorus levels. Now. Uh, Unlike a golf course, which has some restrictions as to what they put on to fertilize the grass, um, some of those same restrictions still go for uh, other other areas. We have to stop the urban development. And one of the biggest issues up in uh, just north of Keswick is the Maple Lake Estates. I think we have to we have to protect those provincially significant wetlands and ensure that the urban development doesn't start cutting down trees and start plowing areas that are going to create uh, that are, a, a, a situation of uh, phosphorus. This is one of the principal reasons I was encouraged and I decided to run in this election. My commitment, my love of this lake leads me to want to protect it. David's absolutely correct. Those kind of situations that the proposal to pave over a provincially significant wetland to increase another to give away another lot for a hundred or sorry a thousand plus new units is inappropriate application of development. Whether we get our drinking water from groundwater sources or surface water sources on the lake, and Radford gets both. We need that water to be filtered properly through a wetland complex. That is the natural way to remove phosphorus and nitrogen uh, pollutants. Preservation of something like the Maple Leaf Estates, the North Columbia, and the integrity, the continuity of the North Columbia Forest is essential. I will commit myself to protect green belt lands in this area and expand it. That is my mission. Those who know me know uh, I'm a strong environmental advocate. I've sat on my uh, town's environmental committee since I came up here a quarter century ago, and uh, I have uh, started uh, at the school board 15 years ago. I got the environment committee going there that has now led to uh, hundreds and hundreds of eco schools within our board. So I, I am a strong protector of the environment, and I've stood up to my own party uh, when it came to putting a stop order on the, the North Golden Bay Forest that they've been talking about. Uh, and I thank these people over here for the excellent work that they've done on that. But uh, when it comes to something that, that you know in your heart is wrong, you have to be ready to stand up to your own government. And that's where experience.
experience comes from, that you know what matters, you know who you are, and you don't roll over to your own leader. Uh, when we had uh, Ford say about paving over the green belt, I didn't hear a squeak from our candidate here. And I think that's so important in this, in this community, in York Simcoe, that we protect our environment. It's so important to me. I look out over um, Georgina and East Willembury, and I can see the lights of Bradford right from my, my desk. And I think that it's important that we protect all that land. Thank you. Well, I'm proud to be part of a party that has a long history of environmental uh, activism. It was, an, it was a PC government that set up the Ministry of Environment in the first place uh, and then enacted the Oak Ridges Marine Act uh, and, and laid the foundation for the foundation for the development of or the protection of the green, uh, the green belt. Uh, and our PC party uh, has committed to maintaining and preserving the Green Belt. We've been very clear on that. And that is what we will do, unlike the Liberal government, which has carved up the Green Belt 17 times in the last year. Uh, and so I am um, committed to um, Unfortunately, while Laura Lee is passionate about it, she's not been successful in persuading her, the Liberal government in listening to her. And I can tell you that I will be a forceful advocate for the environment at Queen's Park, especially on behalf of all the issues that matter to uh, the municipalities in York Simcoe. Everybody knows that wetlands are very important for nature. It, they provide shelter for different animals. They provide us with a lot of stuff. Now the question is, why do we have so much pressure put on this wetland? Can we look at something else. Why do we have to expand that way? Shall we maybe amend zoning laws to allow for a higher population density so we'll ease the pressure on, on, uh, on Greenbelt? I would advocate for this a lot. Thank you. Oh, you're ready to jump back in again, David. That's wonderful. So why is it, folks, that uh, Laura Lee and Carolyn haven't bothered to contribute to the North Guillaume Bay Berry Forest Alliance GoFundMe in order to uh, assist in their legal uh, challenge against the DG group and the preservation of the, of the uh, PSW at Maple Lakes and that the only contributors to that standing on this platform are David and I. Thank you. Yeah, you're ready for that one. Um, the other thing, the, there's so many environmental issues around us. We have the issue of the brown fields uh, around the lake. One, one of the most notable ones is the Thane smelter, uh, which also is contributing to the contamination of the lake as the leachate is progressing from the old decommissioned site into the headwaters of the Mascanonge River. As an insult to the public consultation process, the Liberal government has not only uh, not acted on the re renewed, repeated promises to clean up the site, they have secretly taken it off the list for rehabilitation. And we just have learned about that. The commitment we were asking for the Minister Morrow to preserve the North Millenbury Forest to put in a ministerial order to prevent development, he has refused to do. Even though the, the initial approval for that project came through an order in council from the, from the, from the uh, cabinet. I do not trust Thank you. the Liberals' environmental record. Okay, so you know, first of all, to answer the question about why I haven't uh, uh, donated to, to that, I have uh, donated my time. I'm a single mom. I work as a trustee. Trustee in New York Region makes $25,000 a year, and that's for me and my daughter. So uh, that's why I haven't uh, donated. I didn't inherit money. I work as a public service, and uh, I, I give my time rather than my money. Other people can give their money. I have time to give. Um, as far as Caroline's comment about my government doesn't listen to me, um, I'm not the MPP yet. Um, uh, they don't listen to, uh, uh, they don't 
do uh, what, whatever someone in the community wants. It's our MPP who represents us and goes to guard the government and, and argues for the things we need. So that, that is not my job yet. That is uh, Julia's job, and she's done a fine job representing us for the last 23 years. Sorry if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, that, that's, that's uh, something that's so important that we have a strong voice down there and that we understand how government works and that we make sure that the environment is protected um, as far as what our government is doing. I think our record is very clear on the environment. Thank you. Uh, well, Julia Monroe did draft a letter to Minister Morrow asking um, him to get all parties back to the table uh, because there had been a solution that had been uh, proposed by the municipality and agreed to by many parties um, and things have changed in the interim and so Julia had asked Minister Morrow to get all the parties back to, to the table to discuss this so we can find a solution to protect this provincially significant wetland um, and he never responded and so that's the Liberal government's record on the environment on this issue uh, they're ignoring it and as a result the wetland is in danger Alrighty then, so you guys uh, kind of wasted 10 minutes on me for stretching and goat yoga and everything else. I uh, have two questions left. I'm going to bring the president up of the uh, Bradford Board of Trade. Come. See, it's not going to be me that picks this one, it's going to be her. Oh, she'd like to do both. Are you folks good for another extra couple of minutes? Yeah. There we go. That's why you delegate and arbitrate. Uh, who do I leave off with, David or Dave? To start for the next question. Oh, no. yeah, I do. It's actually you. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Pay attention. How are and you doing? Never ridicule the guy with the microphone. You do know that. Really how are you planning? How are you planning to create, provide jobs for our students and you young adults in Bradford West Wilbury? First off, young people today are leaving school with an unconscionable debt. Um, what we are proposing to do, I mean, people know, I can see a lot of nods with that right now. People have children, people have grandchildren who are graduating from university, and they, how can you start your career, how do you start your life when you're burdened with that much debt overall? What we're proposing to do is to take the uh, OSAP loan program, and we will convert it into grants. It will be retroactive, so that any student who is still burdened by the long-term debt they in, incurred while attending college or university will have those debts forgiven. That's number one. So we're able to allow them at least to begin to start a career on an even footing. The um, advancement, I mean, when we're talking about investing in the, the projects that we're talking about, both in infrastructure, in hospital development, in our roads, we will be stimulating the economy. And that in itself will be a job generator. All of those having the spin-off capacity. When we cut capacity, that's being proposed by, by some people on the panel here, when we cut our infrastructure spending, we not only eliminate the jobs, the, the direct jobs that those cuts affect, but the spin-off jobs in the support corporations, the Thank you. Rest, the rest of them. One of the most important things that we've done uh, for our young workers is increase the minimum wage. Um, we've increased it so that uh, they can, can afford to live and uh, we've also been providing free tuition. A quarter of a million uh, students now have uh, access to, to free tuition through the expanded OSAP. And that makes such a difference, especially to single moms. We've had 
tens of thousands of single moms sign up for free OSAP. They've gone back to school, and uh, if you read the research, it says that the single uh, determining factor, the single most important determining factor in uh, a child's uh, success in life is determined by their mother's level of education. So by getting these single moms back into school and increasing uh, their le education level, it helps their students and generations afterwards. So the, the free tuition is just so important. The other piece, specifically about jobs, is there are a lot of programs that are at the municipal level, either with the town or with the region that help support uh, students looking for, or young people, youth looking for, for work. And a lot of the, the, the money that comes from that is downloaded from the gas tax that we have that's, that comes from the province down to municipality. Thanks. Well, to create jobs for young people coming out of school in Bradford, what we need to do is we need to work with, with businesses uh, so that they can create those opportunities for students who are just entering the job market. Uh, and we have to do that by working with businesses, not against them. Uh, and while Bill 148 does provide a living wage to people who are entering the job market, the way it was introduced made it harder for small businesses to be able to create new jobs. And so we need to work with our businesses so that we can create more and more opportunities for young people entering the job market. We can do that also by cutting red tape so they can spend more money on uh, wages as opposed to on regulations, dealing with their regulations and compliance. We also need to work with students who are in school as they're looking at what kind of opportunities they want to access in the job markets, but what their opportunities could be. And there are a lot of opportunities in areas in the skilled trades. We've got to work with guidance counselors so we can educate students so that they can start transitioning into the right kinds of roles for them. There's a huge skills gap in Ontario. Uh, it's valued at almost $25 billion, and so we need to work with students while they're still in school to do that. <laughs> The question here is why don't we have jobs? Where are all the businesses? What, are, what, what, what has happened with small pop and that business that used to be the backbone of the economy? What has happened with our middle class? Is it possible that the government just helped destroy that middle class? Shouldn't we just look into, let's remove some of those administrative burden, burdens and taxes so, we, so businesses can flourish? We absolutely need to bring business back to Bradford and uh, in our surrounding area. And if there was an easy switch, I'm sure we would have figured out which one to flip. But, but it's not one, it's many. And it's a combination of all of the things that have been talked about so far. Uh, things like reducing the red tape, reducing the hydro costs, making uh, working with small business, and making it work for them to come to Bradford. You know, um, the infrastructure and the highway that we talked about earlier on has also got a lot to play with that. One of the things that the Trillium Party is going to agitate strongly for is to reduce the wait time from someone who graduates from a trade school until he becomes a full apprentice. You know, right now he graduates from, from school and he spends the first three years getting coffee for everybody until so finally after about the fourth year he gets his uh, he gets his paperwork and he can start making, uh, you know, the, the real money, if you will. Thank you. You know, I think that we've got to get him there sooner. Thank you. Are there bottles, anybody? Going once? Going twice? Sold American. Quick pop quiz. All five candidates, starting with Laura Bay. Do you favor reducing the voting age to 16, yes or no? No. Caroline? No. Simple. No. David? No. Dave? No. Yes. Oh my god, they agreed or something. <laughs> <laughs> we'll disagree on the reasons. Ah. Final question of the night before we give them their closing statement. Closing statements, of course, are going to run from Dave all the way up to Laura Lee that way. And this is a good one. Always end on a, a doozy. How do you plan to address Ontario's crippling debt? You're first. I'm, I'm very happy to get this, this question. Uh, we saw under Mike Harris what happens when you cut. We need to continue to invest in things like our schools, 
our, our um, electrical grid. We don't want our hospitals. We don't want to see these things worn down and then take years to, to uh, bring back up to snuff. Um, as a school board trustee, I became a, a trustee. I ran for office uh, when Mike Harris was uprooting our schools. And uh, I saw what happened. A hole in the roof, there was no money to, fund, to fix it. So it ended up leaking into the walls. And we had years and years of prohibitive to repair schools. Schools that were left to rot, exactly to rot and uh, uh, that we have to now replace the whole school so when you're left with a government that that wants to cut 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 you have to think about what that does long term so the liberal plan is about making strategic investments that help grow the economy so when you look at the, our plan for free preschool that builds on all day kindergarten it's not just a pie in the sky dream it actually builds on what we've already done that will put more women into the workforce and for every woman who for every dollar that's spent in, in things like daycare and preschool it's a spin-off of 2.5 dollars to the economy and that's how we pay off the debt by those strategic investments that pay off over the long run thank you <laughs> Well, when you're in a hole, the first thing you do is you stop digging. Uh, and the liberal yeah, yeah, yeah. is to borrow more. Uh, and so we know that's obviously not going to work if we're trying to pay off the debt. Um, and they call it care and they call it investments. But care is really trying to figure out what is right for people in the long term. And what we need in the long term is we need to preserve our ability to pay for the social services and supports that we all deserve and that we need. And we can't do that if we're taking on more and more debt and paying more and more in interest expense. It is crowding out our ability to provide the services that we need. And that's why it's important to stop borrowing and to stop taking on debt that we don't need. Uh, we talk, we, are, we are in a period of economic, we've had a bit of economic growth, but when when, when the economy goes down, and if interest rates go up, this debt is going to cost us even more. And the Liberals are, are planning to just take on more. We are now at $311 billion. Uh, we each owe $21,000 uh, in debt. Thank you. As we, all, as we well know, in the last 15 years, the debt of, debt of Ontario has grown with about 200 billion dollars. Why? It's probably due to infrastructure spending from the liberal side. Why don't they allow <coughs> private sector to step in? Why do they have? Why do they protect those monopoly that much? I don't know. <laughs> David, I wish I had the problem. You know, the Trillium Party is not going to be the uh, ruling party in this, in this election. I mean, that's that's a reality. But let me give you a little idea how, how much debt we've got. $312 billion, you take a $1 bill, which is six inches long. Okay, and we're going to start going on this end to end for $312 billion. We start at Queen's Park, and we go across the Trans-Canada, all the way across the, the prairies, over the, over the Rockies. We're going to get to the Pacific Ocean. We're going to go across the Pacific Ocean putting out these one dollar bills, think of it, just picture it. We're going to go across the Gobi Desert, Europe, land at the England, and go back across the Atlantic, and end up at Queen's Park. And we're going to do it 1,196 times. That is a lot of change for our grandchildren to either pick up or pay the interest on. So as Carolyn says, when you're in a hole, you better stop digging. And it's going to be painful, but we've got to do it. Go ahead, David. And yet the conservative plan will put us into a deeper hole because if you're going to cut all your sources of revenue, you make that hole much deeper and much harder to be able to address your spending costs, or you're going to have to get into some pretty severe cuts. What we're proposing to do is to end the corporate tax giveaway. We want to return the tax rate, the corporate tax rate, up a point and a half to 13%. It's been cut down over the years. By 13%, we'll still be among the lowest in Canada and the upper states. 
maintaining that advantage as well as with our health care benefits, the corporate advantage is still in place. We want to close the loophole that allows businesses, large businesses, or large corporations, large foreign corporations, to qualify for the small business you know, tax rates. We want to implement a surcharge, a new speculation tax, not just limited to foreign buyers, but to stop the artificial inflation of our housing prices and, and bring in some income. Thank you. I got more. You got more? Oh, everybody has more. <laughs> yeah, the number of bottles are all the way through. So, so currently, our uh, budget is balanced. We're actually in a state of surplus. We <laughs> oh, promise. Yeah. It's true. Our, our budget is balanced right now. You can go and look it up online. So the, the Liberal government promised to, uh, I know Doug Ford tells you a lot of stuff, and it's uh, better to listen to the facts. We have a balanced budget. We are in surplus. And uh, the plan was to bring the budget to balance, which the Liberals achieved. They fulfilled that promise. Now, going forward, we're looking at how to make those strategic investments so that we can continue to grow the economy. The economy doesn't grow by cutting. It grows by investing. Like I said, helping women get back up to work spurs the economy. Every dollar invested is $2.50 in, 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 into the economy. We need to make those strategic investments. Otherwise, we're going to go backwards. What are we leaving to our children if we uh, decimate all of the public um, services in the name of efficiencies and cutbacks? We can't keep giving money away to corporations like, like Rob Ford is saying he wants to do. Yeah. Well, it's not Doug Ford who says that uh, we're in a deficit situation as the Auditor General and the SAO. Um, yeah. 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 And you talked about our children and what we're leaving our children. And Don Drummond, who's an economist who provided a, a, an exhaustive report for the Liberals, uh, uh, said today, uh, that the problem is that we're passing on more debt than assets the, to our children. And that that is a real problem of intergenerational unfairness. And so that is what we need to look at. We collect tax dollars from hardworking Ontarians. We owe it to them to stop wasting those dollars. And to do our so that we can make the right investments. Because that's what we all expect and it's what we deserve. Growing up in the former East Bloc gave me a different insight, actually. I've seen firsthand what has happened when the government itself takes on too much and it does not manage it well. I've seen that. All those economies crumbled. In 1889, everything crumbled. Why? Because government was, everything was owned by government, everything was a monopoly. Now, no competition, no real competition was on the market. So I think you can draw your own conclusions. Uh, you know, never mind the uh, Auditor General and the uh, FAO who talks about the, uh, the budget not being balanced. I don't think you could find a, an accounting student anywhere who could pass an exam wherein he takes um, pension funds held in trust and declares that to be revenue. I just don't, if you think that's balanced, I just don't want any of that Kool-Aid. Thank you. And for the final word on the questions, Dave. And I'm actually very scared, I mean, Caroline's comment there about uh, leaving our the future generations more debt than assets. And both of their parties have they've scared me with selling off all of our public assets. The unannounced sale of Hydro One, previously the sale of Highway 407, we've got to maintain control of our assets for long-term planning and long-term uh, return on those investments that we have and pass on those returns to, our, to the next generations. Also, when we're talking about getting access to funds, the Paradise Papers recently revealed, if you think about that for a minute, how much tax avoidance has been going on. The Liberals have received the recommendations on how to proceed with recovering those uncollected uh, taxes. They haven't acted on it. The NDP will. Thank you. Before we draw their closing statements, 
Again, I'd like to thank Julia Monroe for being here. I'd also like to I have the honor of working with her for all the other decades. Yeah, I know it's a long time. Thank you for that. She served you very well for what was here. But again, these candidates stood up and stood in front of you for what was here. Before I thank them, I thank you folks. Democracy takes people. It takes responsibility and it takes action. Do not hold your nose and vote based around something that you don't think. Vote because that's why people are dying around the world. Because they can't. Woo! We fight. Yeah. Yeah. That's the democratic process. So when you're going forward from this, take the information and continue to learn. But vote. I expect a voter turnout, and in my opinion, it'll be low. I want to be proved wrong. I'd like to see 80% of this province vote in an election that means something for our children and grandchildren. That being said, karaoke, coffee cultures, thank you. Bradford Board of Trade, thank you. All the most resources, where are we doing? Thank you. You've got a few counselors kicking around. Don't worry, theirs is coming up in, what, November? October. 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 That's right. So there's a few that will be around. This is Politics 101. Now we get to the conclusion. Dave, you're up. During my three terms of serving on Georgina Town Council, I was bothered by having our plans repeatedly frustrated by provincial governments, both liberal and conservative. We don't have to settle again for a choice between bad and worse. This is why I accepted the opportunity to run in this election in order to address the needs of our community and complete the tasks that can only be done at the provincial level. Whether we get our drinking water from groundwater or from surface water, the health and protection of the watershed is of vital importance to us all. People know from my Georgina Council service that I am committed to a healthy environment, a healthy social environment too, including employment opportunities. I want to bring Lake Simcoe back to full health by reducing the nutrient pollution. Rob Ford assured developers in a backroom agreement of plans to open up the green belt. In a statement he has taken back since he was caught out. But we know where his heart is. We know he won't act to protect the sensitive North Bloomberry Forest or other sensitive wetlands so necessary for the health of our watershed. And the Liberal Minister has stated they will not issue an order to halt the development on the wetlands. Only a new Democrat, only I, with determination to stay on the question and prevent the destruction of the forest complex. I am the right candidate for us in York Simcoe. I don't really have a desire to be starting another whole career, just a desire for completing some important work. I grew up here. I graduated from our schools. I remember drinking water straight from the lake. I served our local councils and I struggled with the same issues you struggle with. I want to be sure that future generations continue to enjoy a high quality of life. Please join me to elect an NDP government. Send me to Queen's Park so I can get good things done. Thank you. Many of my friends have asked me, why are you doing this? Why have I chosen to enter the political arena? This blood sport, as it's often called. Well, it's because I just got sick and tired of having no return phone calls from elected representatives, Julie Monroe accepted. The Thane Smelter cleanup. After 21 years of both conservative and liberal government rule, what have we got? A site that remains contaminated with arsenic, chromium, iron, lead, silver, vanadium, zinc, phosphorus, phenols, and a large quantity of salt, all of which has a pathway into Lake Simcoe. Protest groups and legal involvement have descended upon inert politicians. Maple Lake Estates, 
citizen protest after protest after protest, and 16 years of development being banned on provincially significant wetlands, an urban developer who's a significant political contributor is now in a position to sharpen their chainsaws. They are now in a position to clear an area of 170 acres. That's 30 acres larger than the prior golf course. Those with the political authority to halt this encroachment are stone deaf. Yes, I guess I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired. York Simcoe needs someone who doesn't have to toe the party line, someone who doesn't have to be polite, and someone who's not afraid to stand up in the legislature and bring public awareness to our concerns and generate positive results. That's why I'm here. And that's why I'm asking for you to vote for me on June the 7th. Thank you. As I mentioned a few minutes earlier, I grew up in a former East block. This has given me the opportunity to realize that the most important thing in our lives is freedom. If we don't have freedom, we don't have anything. Doesn't matter your belly is full, doesn't matter you have a roof on top of your head, if you don't have freedom, you have nothing. Trust me. I know what it means. We, we take this freedom as granted here, but what I can see here, this is actually what prompted me to run in this election. What I can see here is government encroachment slowly but surely, slowly but surely in every aspect of your personal lives. Why should it happen this way? It should not be that way. I believe in a lean government. I believe that the government should listen to the needs of the society, act upon it, and this is it. It's just an administrator of public funds. The government does not have to dictate our lives. Vote for Libertarian Party and we'll fight for it. Well, as I sat with families in uh, their kitchens and living rooms, they shared with me their hopes and dreams for the future. And there are things that we all wish for to build a brighter future for ourselves and our families. People in our community are hardworking and want the freedom to succeed without being held back by skyrocketing hydro bills, burdensome taxes, taxes and unthinking red tape. They want a government that listens to them. But after 15 years of liberal governments, life has been more unaffordable for people in York Simcoe and across Ontario. It's getting tougher and tougher for families to make ends meet. Since 2003, the average family's hydro bill has gone up by $1,000 a year. Small businesses are closing down and people are losing their jobs because it's too hard to do business in Ontario. The provincial debt is $311 billion, $21,000 per person, and we are paying a billion dollars a month to service it. This means that less is being invested in the supports and services we need and we deserve. Most disappointing, though, is that the Liberals and the NDP are planning to borrow more to pay for their election promises, putting our social programs and our prosperity at even greater risk. The other candidates here this evening have told you that they're the only one with a plan to help Ontario families and businesses grow and thrive. And I believe that they believe that. But the reality is that their promises come with heavy costs and no real plan to address the massive debt that they will incur. And in the end, Ontario families will be worse off than we are today. I will not tell you that there will be quick and simple solutions to the messes that have been created over the past 15 years. What I will tell you though is that the PC party's priority, my priority, is to help people in York Simcoe and in Ontario thrive once again by creating the conditions for success it's time to do things differently in Ontario, and I hope I have the honor of being your voice for change at Queen's Park. I want to thank 
the Bradford Board of Trade and the Hall of Marshmallows Association and my friend Jamie here for moderating. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues here for a very, well, pretty respectful debate. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, the big question that you should all be leaving with is how are they going to pay for this? Uh, the Liberal government's uh, platform is all costed. Uh, we haven't seen a, plat a cost of platform from the Conservatives and uh, uh, major hole was found in the NDP platform uh, as far as their costing goes based on 2017 rather than 2018. So how will they play, pay? We've all agreed with the services that a growing community like Bradford needs, but we hear cuts, cuts, cuts. So this election is a very clear choice. It's the choice between cuts or care. And no disrespect to the three gentlemen down the end, that in New York Simcoe, this is a two-way race. Um, and it's very clear what we're seeing here, uh, that the difference between the two candidates. We, we have a uh, someone who is an experienced local leader with a local plan uh, that I, I'm willing to stand up for this community and uh, respect the people here and make sure that their voice is heard down at Queen's Park. Um, I'm running I'm not because I think everything is perfect, I'm running because I am a change maker. You've seen it on uh, the York Region Board, the change I was able to make there, and uh, I'm, I'm willing to continue to do that. I'm not afraid to stand up. I have a local plan that includes increasing GO trains, uh, uh, putting in the 400-404 link, uh, building schools, and a hospital to service South Simcoe. And Liberals have a plan to pay for that. We need someone who's going to invest in our growing community and not pie-in-the-sky dreams that you can balance a budget by making cuts and still building these things. I've been in charge of the $1.5 billion budget on the school board for many years, and I know there's tough choices to be, be made. If you cut revenue, you cannot make the investments that you're promising. I know that firsthand. We need to protect our vital services and keep Ontario the leader, uh, leading economy that it is. I'm an experienced local leader with a local plan, and I hope that I've demonstrated that and I want you to vote. Thank you. Well, we've heard it all tonight. Hopefully this is the first of many debates that you guys have about this. June 7th is the election. And all I can say is thank you so much for coming out. It shows that there is actually interest in what we do. And I'm sorry for getting you out two minutes later than what I thought. Thank you.